It's my pleasure to welcome Pedro Ferreira from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I won't give a long introduction. His bio was circulated with a talk announcement. Um, I guess the noteworthy things are that he did some degrees at other places like CMU and MIT. Um, but in 2005, 2004-5 was a postdoc here at the School of Information. Um, now he does really interesting work at the intersection of sort of computer science, management science, um, economics using a mix of standard computational methods as well as like rigorous econometrics um, from RCTs to observational studies, looking at things from peer influence to um, media consumption as well as the impacts of technology on education, which is what he's going to talk about now. So let's give an outsized welcome for the three of us uh, to Pedro Ferreira. And, and sorry, I should say, um, I think the norm for this seminar will be to interrupt and ask questions, is that um, what you expect? Um, sort of econ rules rather than computer science rules. Um, so again, a warm round of introduction for uh, Pedro Ferdeda, thanks. Thank you. I think I have this one here. Can you guys hear me well? Okay, so thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Josh. I had some slides, I still have some slides about who I am. I'll probably take 30 seconds instead of five minutes talking about who I am. But uh, I've been passionate about two things. One is uh, the la changing landscape of entertainment and uh, media consumption with the uh, streaming technologies. And so I have done significant work on that front. And I'm also very much interested in education, educational outcomes, how can we actually improve education using technologies. Um, and as Josh said, a bulk of my work is probably in peer effects and recommender systems. Uh, there's a bunch of papers here that you can see that essentially are looking at peer influence, impacts of likes, likes is a social signal, it's also peer influence. Uh, a paper that I like a lot is target the ego or target the group, where we actually do a randomized experiment in a network, and we actually try to see if targeting people individually versus targeting them in groups makes a difference, and there's interference across conditions and so on, so this is um, a paper that I actually like a lot myself. Um, more recently, we have been working on the welfare effects of uh, recommender systems. Recommender systems might discriminate in ways that we are not even aware of. And so can you actually understand the welfare implications of, of recommender systems? Uh, and so on and so forth. I've also been looking at, as I told you, how the advent of streaming has been changing consumption in the industry. So what's the impact on, on piracy from uh, Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon, all these uh, new opportunities that we have now. Uh, Time Shift TV is also a, st a streaming technology. Uh, and one paper that uh, I've been recently working on is the impact of binge watching on the consumption of VOD. Everybody loves binge watching. Our paper shows that when you actually binge watch, you subscribe less because you watch everything that you want to watch very quickly. That's the punchline of the paper, which comes as a surprise to, to, to industry practitioners. We're working these days on, a, on an experiment about experts versus experts plus machines. So the idea here is to see if uh, uh, experts in uh, movie recommendation can actually add, add anything to the collaborative filtering and uh, content-based recommender systems that we already have in place. If there is some combination there that can, uh, can improve what the machines recommend. And most, most of this work has been uh, large scale in vivo RCTs. So uh, large scale, I mean hundreds of thousands of households uh, that randomly get stuff versus don't. And so we try to find out in a controlled setting what are the causal effects of those treatments. And in vivo, these are real consumers. They don't know they're part of experiments. So there's no uh, bias from, from, from that perspective. I am also interested in, in education. For a long time, actually, my first papers were looking at the impact of broadband in schools on the performance of students. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Spillover effects from wiring schools with broadband. It's something that I, we also looked at. The paper that I'm going to be talking about today is smartphones in the classroom. And I'm also looking at exploring Wi-Fi locks to understand how, how students behave on, on campus. Mostly. These studies are observational studies. We need to be creative and rigorous to try and find causal effects from observational studies. And I'm trying to move my work in the educational setting from observational studies to experiments. For example, the paper I'm going to discuss today, Smartphones in the Classroom, is my first small scale, you know, you have to start small, uh, randomized experiment in education. Something that I'm really, really thrilled about 
is entertainment in education. And that's what I plan to do for the next uh, few years until I find something interesting. Uh, but I think it's our duty to, to improve education. And we are increasingly using video to improve education. So I really want to know what's going on with video. Uh, we're using a bunch of machine learning techniques to extract features from videos and then putting the students through these videos and trying to understand if they learn and if they learn then which features of the videos made them learn and can we actually try and tease out what, what are good characteristics of videos, can we actually produce those videos in the first place. And then I'm running a number of, of experiments in parallel uh, about this idea of uh, um, understanding how we can improve video for, for, for learning purposes. And one uh, idea is that um, you really learn something when you need to teach somebody else. Maybe we have all been through that, uh, that point. And so one question is, should we actually ask students to create videos to teach to their peers in the first place? And one experiment that I'm running is whether when a student is tasked to create a video to explain a concept to a peer, that's when that person actually learns that concept really well. So testing if these hypotheses of, of learning by teaching, there's a doctoral evidence that this works. My goal is to do large scale observational and, and randomized control trials in this field. So there's a bunch of observational work here because we're mining educational videos from YouTube, trying to find all the features, relate features to whether students like videos, which doesn't mean that they actually learn. There's a difference in the outcome there. And then putting students randomly in front of videos with different characteristics and finding out the causal effect of features and combinations of features on performance. Okay. So that's what I'm, I'm working on right now. I'm happy to discuss all of this in more detail if we, if we have time. But I'll, I'll jump to, to the paper that I, I would like to discuss with you today, which is this idea from smartphones to smart students. Uh, if, we, if we allow smartphones into the classroom, uh, what happens to the students in terms of how they behave place and then how, um, how they perform. So, this is the agenda for today. Let me give you a little bit of the context and then explain to you what, what is the experiment that we run uh, and what we find. And then I'll wrap up with some policy implications uh, from, from these findings. Uh, smartphone penetration increased dramatically in the US. You, we all know about that, right? But also in schools. Uh, the, the reliable data that I have pertains to 2015, but you can see that more than half of the students in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, all of them are carrying s s cell phones, and these devices will get into the classroom no matter what. I, I think it's extremely hard to, to ban them from the classrooms, although some people are trying to do that, and that's one condition that we should test, if ban banning the smartphones from the classroom actually makes a difference. Um, Although there's, there's this pervasiveness of smartphones, uh, I think little is still known how these devices actually affect students in educational settings. And uh, what we find is that there's no consensus about whether they should be brought into the classroom or not. But the, the distribution of opinions is actually very bimodal. On the one hand, we have the parents and the teachers which are usually against bringing smartphones into the classroom. Because there's distraction, there's access to unreliable information, cheating, cyberbullying, distress, and so on and so forth. So all these, these reasons are reasons pointed by both parents and teachers to forbid um, these devices from entering the, the classroom. And based on these opinions, several policymakers ban smartphones from the classroom. For example, a, a country like France country-wide policies establish that all students aged 3 to 15 should leave their smartphones at home or for emergency purposes and safety and so on and so forth, take them to the classroom, but they're off and they're turned on if an emergency comes or there's a contact hour with the parents or something like that. Um, there's similar discussions in, in other countries, US, UK, China, India, and so on and so forth. So this is a nationwide policy to ban smartphones from schools. On the other end, students are in favor of smartphones in, 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 in the classroom. They say that uh, they can effectively help during the lectures, find information, assist learning, uh, and there's a bunch of educational um, uh, apps that, they, that support a little bit this, this idea. There's so much software, so many apps, so many things that students can actually in, use productively to learn that perhaps uh, the, the students are right. Yeah. Those are not actually 
Now, this is just this is j surveys uh, online and a bunch of other things where usually parents, the idea is that uh, if you run a survey, uh, you have 50% of the, the subjects b believe that the smartphones should be there and the others should not be, and the other 50 should not be th there. And when you find it's the 50% that don't want is the parents and the teachers, and this is just a collection of surveys online. We run, we run our own survey, uh, survey on Canical Turk, we also find 42, 58%. Uh, so these are not research papers, essentially, are uh, more um, quotes about this, this divide. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, so one, one idea that I think is interesting is that smartphones, well, they facilitate real-time interaction, collaboration, and so on, but might actually relieve students, uh, schools, from the investment in, 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 in other types of technologies. If the students bring the smartphone into the classroom and it can be used to assist learning, maybe the, the, the schools don't need to put significant dollars into interactive boards or something like that. It's like when you go on airplanes today. I mean, it's your screen, not the, the, the screen on the, on, the, on the seat anymore, right? So what do we know about, in general, the effect of technology on educational outcomes? Uh, it's a mixed bag essentially. So I, I, I'm not going to go through all these studies, but there's a bunch of studies that look at the impact of technology on education and find positive effects. Uh, so for example, subsidy for ICT funding uh, affects uh, positively scores in English and science. Home computer. If you have computers at home, you have better scores as a student. Uh, Computer-aided instruction and computer-adaptive homework, now not at home, but in the schools, computer in the schools, you also have uh, evidence that of, of increased uh, scores in math and algebra, pre-algebra, and so on and so forth. So there's a significant literature that finds positive effect of ICTs on educational outcomes. But there's also significant, lit significant literature that um, doesn't show any evidence. Uh, so, for example, I just told you here that computer-aided instruction seems to have a positive impact on students' performance, but other people find no, that's really not the case. We don't find any significant impact in math and uh, Hebrew scores. Uh, so even subsidies for ICTs, I just told you subsidies for ICTs improve performance. Well, not necessarily. For example, this well-known paper in schools in California show that there's no... no no, no, no effect. Uh, computers in schools, uh, broadband speed, there's a number of papers as well that show no effect of ICTs on educational outcomes. And there's even papers that show negative effects. Uh, I have one paper myself that shows that when we introduce broadband in schools, actually the grades of the students in SAT scores like ninth grade uh, go down, and this is mediated by how actually the internet is used in the schools. So I can talk at length about this paper because it's my paper, but I can tell you that if the students go on Facebook and uh, YouTube and so on and so forth, in 2005, 2010, when the, this, this paper pertains to, then uh, they, they become worse off. If you block those apps in school, they become a little bit better off. Yeah? No, no. Uh, so so, so the, 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 inve the papers on investment in ICTs is essentially a paper about these schools got this investment, look what happened to the students, there's nothing in between that actually explains how the investment was used, how this, this, the, the, the technology is used. Um, one thing that we claimed was a contribution of this paper, and I still think was this paper was, we had measures of how much students use the internet uh, which in 2010, when, when we did this study, was the first time I saw that in the literature, because most papers to, to, to date were about availability. And many papers are about availability of broadband at a zip code level or at a school level. Does this school have broadband or not? Zero, one. You don't know if it's actually people are using or not. We, here we have measures of how many bytes they exchanged with, with the internet. Uh, so it varies on what this, these studies can do. Home, uh, internet may also have a, a negative impact. Subsidy for computers may also have, have a negative impact. And now here are some papers that actually look at usage of laptops and tablets in class. And, and these uh, papers found negative impacts on the performance of the students. So I don't want to distill 
all of what's going on here, but I would uh, at least like to make the point that there's, this is a mixed bag. There's significant evidence in one way or another, but also this is, is very dif difficult to compare all of this. This is different countries, different time periods, different technologies. I mean, there is no point to say you should all go in one direction and another direction when we're studying with many different tools, sometimes RCT, sometimes IV, RD, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the fact that we have all these different directions at least point us to this is complex. It's hard, it's context dependent and so on and so forth. And so I have an experiment that I'm gonna show you in this paper, which occurred in the vocational school in China. I'm not gonna tell you I know what would happen in California, right? I need to be very careful about that. But at least I have an RCT and we get some specific measures of how the students use the smartphone in the classroom that can enlighten us of what to look for in other contexts. So this seems to be a, a very rich landscape, even in terms of results. Uh, and the only paper that I actually know about the, looking at the, the impact of smartphones on the performance of students is this paper by Acker uh, in 2012, where essentially students were trained to use mobile phones, place phone calls, text messages, and so on and so forth. And then in the end of the day, they find out that the usage of these devices improves writing and math test scores. And they try to actually talk a little bit about the mechanism of about why that happens. And the authors argue in the paper that what happened was not inside the classroom, but was the fact that these devices allowed people to actually contact each other after the classroom, get together, solve exercises, and so on and so forth. So it's uh, the smartphone used in after class hours to, to, to connect. Okay. So there is always this inherent trade-off when we talk about technology in education, learning versus distraction. Smartphones are no different in that respect. They introduce opportunities to learn with access to, to, to information and real-time feedback, but distraction. People use smartphones in the classroom to go on social media, to go and look for entertainment, news, and so on and so forth. Right? So it looks like that if you actually want to learn a little bit more about how the smartphones affect the performance of students, you need to be able to measure learning and distraction. Okay? And this is hard. This is hard to do. There's a, different disciplines use different metrics based on the methods and what they can collect. In economics, uh, there's lots of papers that look at time on task. In psychology, you have uh, eye tracking, mouse tracking, neurosciences, EEG, MRI, and so on and so forth. In online businesses, we have timestamps of how much Consumers spend looking at products, characteristics, and so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of different measures. Not, not, uh, not all of them are, are, I mean, some of them are good and all of them are good and bad. Some of them are, are macro level, some of them are mi micro level, some of them are self-reported and have problems. The ones that are not self-reported can scale and so on and so forth. There's a bunch of things that are going on. In, in education in particular, we have these continuous performance tests that try to measure uh, how often students remember um, remember uh, events over time. And in online education, there's a number of papers that look at uh, how long do you actually use these technologies, which is self-reported. Again, I mean, we just survey students and ask them, you were working on this homework, how, how much time did you spend on the smartphone or the tablet or the, which URLs did you visit and so on and so forth. I think one, con one of the contributions of the paper that I'm showing you today is that we, we actually obtain videos from the lectures, and so we can look at what the students are doing during the lecture and code the time spent on distraction versus learning. Of course, that's subjective. We'll talk a little bit about that in, in a second, but we bring these measures, which I think is a novelty in education at the student level, to know that each particular student spent these many seconds distracted versus learning on the smartphone, off the smartphone. I think that that's, that's an interesting, unique data set that we are exploring here. Okay. So this is just to give you a little bit of the context for why are we interested in this, and in particular one reason why we're interested in this, and I think this research is timely, is that there are countries banning smartphones from classrooms. This is a, a, an issue that is on the top of the policy agenda in many places. So we run an experiment, and let me show you what we did. So we partnered with a vocational school in China in November 2017, okay, so it's to November 2017, just, just, just um, remind me of that, um, 
yeah, I could never do an experiment and get results so quickly. Uh, so, so we had uh, almost 500 students uh, in the class of, of 2019. So these, these numbers are all wrong, okay? Uh, it must be, oh yeah, the class of 2019, and they got in in 2017. Okay, so now it makes sense. Uh, 2019 is when they get, uh, they get out. Uh, so they all require to take Chinese verbal. Okay, so Chinese verbal is understanding words in Chinese from traditional prose in Chinese. So some texts that uh, are in the curricula that the students were not very familiar with. And the, 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 the course on uh, Chinese verbal is in trying to understand the functions of these words in these sentences. I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but it's essentially a, a, a class on Chinese verbal. And so what did we do? We had all these students and we uh, split them randomly into three groups. So for 182 students, we got 125 selected at random, and we put them in one condition called smartphone band. So these students, when they go to a particular lecture, and this is just about one lecture, uh, they're asked to place the smartphone in the back of the, of the room. Okay? Uh, this is called the condition C4 control. Then uh, uh, another group of 125 students, also selected at random, were allowed to take the smartphone into the classroom and use the smartphone as they wish during the lecture. Okay? This is called condition TA, treatment with the smartphone allowed into the classroom. Okay? And another set of 125 students selected at random were put in the third condition, which is they could take the smartphone into the classroom but the teacher at some times in the classroom would ask them to use the smartphone to learn some words. And I'll explain what that means in a second. We call this condition TI, where the smartphone is used to support instruction. Okay? So these are the three conditions that we have. Smartphones banned from the classroom, for smartphones allowed into the classroom, and students could use them as they please. And then smartphones allowed into the classroom, Students could use as they please, but the teacher would actively ask them to use a smartphone here and there to learn some words. Questions? So these, these students, is the, the, the 482 students, are all the students that need to take Chinese verbal as part of their curricula. Okay? All the ones that got into the school in 2017. Um, and so they all need to take this course. They are from different majors. I can tell you that, accounting, computer science, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, we have 125 because we use one classroom that can take 125. So that's why we didn't use the 482. We use three random groups of 125 because that's the capacity of the class where the lecture took place. I'll, I'll give you more details as we go along, but I, I, I also want to make sure that we are on the same page about what the experiment is and the conditions. Okay. So what happened in each of these lectures? Uh, well, the students get into the classroom and, uh, and they are in one of these conditions. So in the, in the condition that the smartphones are banned, they, they, they take a pretest. That's the first thing that happens when they get into the classroom. So they're asked a bunch of, uh, of questions about the words learn in the classroom. So this is the pretest so that we can know how much they know about the subject to begin with. The policy is announced. So for example, in condition C, the students are told now the smartphones have to go to the back of the room. Then the lecture takes place, and then there's a post-test. Okay. The post-test and the pretest are actually the same questions in this case. Okay. Uh, in the condition TA, again, the same setting, it's just the only difference is that the policy announced is different. The policy is that uh, you can use the smartphones during the lecture if you want. And in condition TI, the policy announced is that uh, we're actually going to be using the smartphone in the classroom during the lecture to do a few things, and then the teacher would explain in more detail. Okay, so that's what's going on. They don't know they were randomly assigned to different conditions. Uh, the experiment took place, so let me tell you a little bit. We tried to control for a number of different things. So the pretests are, the average score in the pretest is going to be the same for across all conditions, right? Just to, because they were randomly assigned. And um, I don't think they knew ahead of time which condition they were in. in using the smartphone to support instruction, I think, came as a surprise to the, these 125 in the last condition. 
Okay. So we want to make sure that the only thing that changes across these conditions is the policy, because we want to find the effect of the policy on the outcomes. So the lectures are given by the same teacher. So the same teacher gives a lecture to the guys in condition C, in condition TA, and in condition TI. The same teacher who was asked, please give the same lecture, right? Um, at the same pace, in the same classroom, at the same time of the day, in three consecutive days. That was the best that we can do. Any questions? There are, I have some questions, right? I mean, because condition C was in the first day, condition TA was in the second day, condition TI was in the third day. You can tell maybe the students talk to each other. Actually, we ordered conditions in this way to minimize any potential interference. Um, and we can talk more about that, but uh, knowing that the smartphone was going to be used to, us to aid instruction could not be inferred from band or condition at will without without uh, the teacher asking. So we actually took a little bit of care, but of course it needed to be at the same time of the day so that tiredness would not come into the picture, same teacher, same pace, and so on and so forth. The teacher explained the pronunciation, definition, etymology of, of the words. Um, and we chose a lecture, a lecture where the words that were learned were in the curricula for China but the students were usually unfamiliar with. And we'll, we see that in the pretest scores that they have very low scores and then they actually learn the words. Uh, so this is pretty much similar to introducing smartphones to help instruction of something that you don't know much about. That's the, that's the, the context here. What about the tests? The same pre and post tests, students did not know that uh, there would be a post test and that would be the same. Um, assessing the knowledge uh, taught in this class. The smartphones were turned off during the tests, otherwise uh, it wouldn't be fair. There were multiple choice questions. Uh, and what happened in the third condition? Well, in the third condition, the students were told that they could use the smartphone to scan a QR code on, in the corner of their desk that would automatically put them in front of this app. Okay? This app is all in Chinese, yeah, there's some things in English here so that both you and I can understand what was going on, which is essentially you just type a word, you look up the pronunciation, the meanings, the definition, the etymology, and so on and so forth. So this is a snapshot of the app that they could use. And here and there, when the teacher uh, taught new words, the teacher would say, don't, don't forget, you can quickly go to the app and learn a little bit on, on this app about the words. So there's nothing specific about this app. This is not a great app. This is an app developed with minimal effort by us for this experiment. I, all, I suspect that people that know how to develop apps for education will do just a much better job than we do. This is not necessarily very different from typing the word on Google and trying to find. This is just one way to perhaps reduce the distraction of the smartphone when the smartphone comes into the classroom and use the device in, uh, in a productive way. So I'm not claiming that this, is, this app is what makes the difference. There will be probably better apps, okay? Okay, th so that's what's going on. Maybe I can stop here for a minute or to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what are the conditions and what is that we're going to compare. And perhaps it's not yet clear what we're going to compare because I forgot to tell you that. So let me go back to this and explain that what we have for each condition is a measure called performance gain. So for condition C, I have the, the, the grade of a student in the pretest and the post-test. So I compare those two. And this, that's the performance gain for that student. And I'm going to compare the performance gains across the three conditions. Does that make sense? If you want, I can just look at the post-test scores because the pre-test scores are all the same across different conditions anyways. We just decided to put a pre-test to actually show the balance to begin with. Uh, it's yeah. All right. Yep. 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 Yeah. Those, the, yeah. 
those are limitations of this study. Let's be very honest about that, right? Uh, we could do this about one lecture. Uh, and so I know what happened in that 90 minute period. I don't know if the effects persist over time. Um, we are still trying to, f we can repeat the experiment if we want with this school. They, they liked a lot the results and so on and so forth. But um, it's unclear how we deal with interference over time because then the students will talk to, the students might not have talked in these three days, but they will talk across a period of three weeks or whatever. So if there's any good ideas, maybe we need to use different schools. Uh, so that, that's that long term versus short term. In particular, in the school setting, I think interference is a big problem. And so we don't really have long term effects here. Uh, and the other thing that, oh, that you were saying was uh, long term versus. Yeah. Short term. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so those are good points. Uh, and, and, and that engagement would fade over time? Is that the problem? Potentially. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Yes, so, so that was the, the, the other point, yes. Um, um, I think there's a number of things here that we'll see in the descriptive statistics that I think might be particular from China, and we'll, we can talk about those. Um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get as much as I can to the mechanisms behind what's happening. And if we believe that these mechanisms make sense, then we can think of maybe other countries that behavior is a student in the class so I mean I cannot say anything about other 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 places but uh, the more I understand and I identify the micro behavioral mechanisms the more we can say this is perhaps from a different baseline this is, could be happening elsewhere or this could be happening for example one question that I'm asked many times is you study smartphones what about tablets I mean I'm torn between telling you I know nothing about tablets because that's not what I experimented with. But in the other, on the other hand, tablets allow you to do many similar things to smartphones. You could also have this app on the smartphone, on the tablet, and so on and so forth. So maybe there's some opportunity here for generalization, but I don't want to claim more than I can. Yeah, so I'll show you the times. The times are not actually that big. We ensured that the, the, the students would, uh, that the teacher would teach the lecture at the same pace. So this would have been substituted by looking at the material a bit more, like one more minute or something like that. Okay. But that's a good point. So let me just show you descriptive statistics. The data, the data sources and the descriptive statistics on aggregate, and then we will split it into different conditions. So we use three anonymized data sets. In this, in this paper. One is we have some archival historical data provided by the school, like uh, demographics, uh, gender, birth, place, major, uh, that are used to show balance, essentially, that uh, we don't have, uh, the students across all conditions are on average similar on a bunch of different covariates that we have from that. Okay. Then we have um, test scores, so the, the score in the pre-test and the score in the post-test, so if I take the difference between the, these two scores for each student, I have what's called a performance gain during the lecture, right? And the tests were des de uh, designed by the teacher. The grades are on a 100-point scale, and they are multiple choice questions. And the same course in structure graded all tests anonymously uh, to ensure consistency, right? So it's not that the... Uh, I was asked before, uh, maybe the instructor wants to ban smartphones from the classroom, so if the teacher knows these are the guys that ban the smartphones, maybe I'll spend a little bit more time getting these guys. Although this was multiple, uh, multiple, question, multiple choice questions anyways, but um, you know, people get tired as they grade 300 of these anyways. Okay. Uh, the third data set that we have is we have the video feeds of the class. Uh, and this allows us to split 90 minute lecture into time that the students spend learning on the smartphone, LS, learning on the smartphone, learning without the smartphone, learning other, LO, distraction using the smartphone and distraction without using the smartphone. 
Okay, so let me give you a little bit more of context about this. All lectures took place in a large classroom, maybe like this, where there's a, there's a video system, and everybody knows that there's a video system in that lecture in that lecture hall, that is used for anti-cheating purposes. Okay, uh, so what usually happens is that when there's suspicion after after grading exams and so on, if there's some suspicion that there was uh, something going on. People, staff in the school can go back to the video feeds and find out if there was something going on. Um, so we have the video data, we have the video feeds, uh, and we match that to the 367 students across our conditions. And coding the video features, of course, it's subjective. Right. Uh, there were discussions with the people that were coding, this group of 20 coders, that would look at the video feeds and would say, uh, this guy was distracted on the smartphone from timestamp A to timestamp B, and was distracted away from the smartphone from timestamp C and timestamp D. And I think there's lots of subjectivity here, because I can be watching outside the window, and that's when I'm really reasoning about what's going on. It's, it's what it is, let me put right there that we, this is what we have. Of course, what we did was uh, we asked several coders to code the same piece of video and see if there was any agreement across the across what they did, and the agreement is pretty pretty significant, okay? So that's what we get from the video lecture, lecture feeds. Um, so generally speaking, the lectures are 90 minutes long. There's five minutes for the pre-test to begin with and five minutes for the post-test, okay? And students spend 88% of the lecture time learning. This is when I think could be something about China. At least my Chinese co-authors and other people that have looked at this paper think this makes sense. I wish my lectures could be <laughs> like that. But they spend a significant amount of time learning during the classroom. And they spent 39% uh, uh, <coughs> um, of the, the, the time distracted is distracted away from the smartphone. Okay. Here you can see that there was a significant increase in the, in the score in the test. So uh, out of 100 points, before the class started, the average grade was 29. So they really didn't know much about this subject. As I told you, they were unfamiliar with the words. And after the lecture is done, their average score was 81. So there was a significant increase. And then again, as we discussed, maybe the week after they don't remember anything. But at least during that lecture, there was a significant increase from 30 to 80. Right? So a subject that uh, students were very unfamiliar with to something that they, they learned quite well during these 90 minutes. So this is just to give you an idea of what is that is going on here in our data sets. And the idea to retain here is students spend a significant amount of time learning during the lecture, and they go from 30 to 80 in terms of scores. Okay? So now that we have this data, what can we learn about the effect of the smartphone policy on the test scores? Well, we have a, a randomized control trial here, and uh, one thing that I like to do is just to do t-tests when I have that because everything else is the same. And so I'll just look at what happens to the average of the, the, the scores and we'll, we'll go from there, okay? So here is a table uh, where we can see condition C, smartphone ban, condition TI, smartphone allowed, condition TI allowed and used for instruction, and then the three differences that we can think about. And I think it's very clear from this table that you see that when I compare smartphone allowed into the classroom and smartphone banned, uh, grades go down, right? 39% of a standard deviation, okay? So the average pre-test score um, was 29, and then it goes to 52, and here was to, uh, in condition C, and in condition TA it was 27, very similar to 29, but it only goes to 46 in this case. So what we can see here is that uh, banning the smartphone from the classroom improves grades, or allowing the smartphone into the classroom without instruction reduces grades. But uh, introducing the smartphone into the classroom with instruction improves. The, the, the grade. So you see here we had a negative minus 6.3 and here positive 4.3, right? 
So if you want to think about the status quo of smartphones allowed into the classroom, that's the worst. It imp uh, the grades improve a little bit if you ban them, but much more if you actually allow them into the classroom and use them for instruction. Okay. Is that everybody sees that from the tables? Okay. Uh, so here we have a, a, an improvement of 50% of a standard deviation, which uh, from my knowledge of the education literature, 50% of a standard deviation is a significant improvement in, in performance. Uh, this is all obtained with t-tests. If, if I run regressions, I'll get the same thing because this was a randomized experiment. Maybe I'll get a little bit more power because I control for student level uh, controls. But here, the regression I can, gr I can run is performance gain on your treatments, whether the smartphone was allowed or not, whether it was allowed and actively used for instruction or not. So I'm interested in that uh, um, those two coefficients, beta 1 and beta 2. And if I run the regressions, that's what I find. So nothing very different from what we have seen before. There's the, the, the minus 6.3 and the plus 4.3. With or without controls, everything remains the same. I gain some statistical significance, but clearly, we have this ordering of conditions. Smartphones, smartphones allowed, but used for instruction even better. So we are here at the point where we say, if we ban the smartphones from the classroom, your grades will be better. But better than banning is actually allowing, but making something useful with, with them during, during the lecture. So can we dive deeper into what's going on here? We can, right? We can because we, we have uh, times that students spend in these things, right? Here, these regressions is just a relationship between which policy are you in and your test scores. But there's more to the story because um, the policies affected the time spent on and off the smartphone, on and on distracted, and those times then affect the performance. So my goal now is going to be to put the times that students spend distracted and learning on and off the smartphone in between the policies and the outcomes to see if we can explain something that is going on in the, through, from the policies to the behavior, from the behavior to the, to the performance outcomes. OK? Yeah. We have heterogeneity as well. Um, I'll tell you which kinds of students are driving the results in, in the end. Yeah. We only have 375 students, so I, I was not very um, enthusiastic about it, but it turns out that we can actually even find heterogeneous effects with this, because maybe because of the precision. So, anyways. Uh, so let's see what happens. So these tables are very big, lots of numbers, so just look at what I tell you, <laughs> OK? The first thing that is actually quite interesting to me is that asking the students to use smartphones for learning purposes did not change the amount of time they spend using the device. So consider these two conditions, condition TA and condition TI. So the smartphone gets into the classroom, and in one condition is just used at will by the students, and in another is used at will by the students, and sometimes the teacher asks students, can you use the smartphone? and so on. In those two cases, the time that the students spent distracted was the same. Okay? And it is the same time as they spend it distracted even when the smartphone is banned from the classroom. Okay? So what does this mean? So let's think about this in a little bit more detail. In the condition C, class, uh, smartphones banned from the classroom, Students could uh, be learning without a smartphone or distracted without a smartphone. Smartphone is not in the classroom in this condition. So either you're learning with a smartphone, listening to the teacher, going over the materials, trying out the exercises, or then distracted without a smartphone. Dozing off, sleeping, looking away, talking to each other, and so on and so forth. So all, think about all the things that you can do when the smartphone is not in the classroom and split them into learning and distraction. Okay? Now, introduce the smartphone into the classroom, conditions TA and TI, the students can get distracted on the smartphone, playing games, browsing for news, going on social media, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's going to be some distraction that was done away from the smartphone that's going to go to the smartphone now. 
some substitution. So if we put this in, 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 in a picture, so we have here smartphones allowed into the classroom and use that wheel, smartphones banned, and smartphones allowed with distraction. And so if you go from left to right in this axis, the performance increases. This is where the students were worse. This is the medium, this is the best. And on the vertical axis, I have uh, time distracted in minutes. And so what we find is when the smartphone doesn't get into the classroom, they are 11 minutes distracted, okay? Out of the 80 minutes of class. When the smartphone gets into the classroom and it's allowed for instruction, then the distraction away from the smartphone reduces. Smartphone is added. But in total, it's the same uh, value, 11 to, to, to 13. It's pretty much the same. So we can see here that these guys were distracted away from the smartphone. When the smartphone gets in, there's some substitution in the distraction. But the total pretty much remains the same. Okay. When the smartphone is allowed into the classroom and used for instruction, a similar picture occurs. Right? This is the distraction away from the smartphone, not very different from this one. And then some, there's some distraction on the smartphone, again, similar, the, 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 the sum of the two. So what the point that I'm trying to make is these three bars show some dis substitution of distraction away from the smartphone to the smartphone, but in total, this, the three are the same. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we can talk about the subjectiveness of that, but we have uh, at least 12, 12, 12 or 16 cameras, and you can actually see which game they're playing and all these kinds of things. It is, yes. Um, so the data that we have is anonymized and uh, we don't know more than the, the times. The, the, all this data is actually kept in China in the school. We don't actually know anything else. Um, but this was something that for me was very interesting. You because if I think as a policymaker, uh, the first thing that I think is you introduce technology into the classroom like smartphones and everybody gets distracted. Well, in total, not as much. Now you can tell me this is something that is particular from this teacher from China and so on and so forth. And I have to say, maybe yes, but apparently here the smartphone was introduced into the classroom and there's substitution of distraction f away from the smartphone to the smartphone, but overall the time spent on distraction is the same. Okay. So essentially we have two interventions here, allowing smartphones into the classroom use that wheel and allowing smartphones to the classroom and used for instruction that maintain the amount of time that students spend learning during the classroom, okay? Now, what I think is quite interesting is, I just showed you that the amount of distraction is the same across these three conditions, but we know the performance is different across the three conditions. So the conclusion is, if you look at the, if you look at the, at the amount of time that students spend distracted versus learning, that doesn't predict performance. Does that make sense? So I'm just showing you here, this, they spend as much time distracted here as here as here, but the performance are different. So distraction on aggregate doesn't predict performance. Okay? My point here is what's gonna predict performance is where is distraction taking place? Is it on the smartphone or off the smartphone? That's the point that I'm, I'm trying to make. Okay? Yeah, let me show you this picture from the learning side as well. Uh, that, that's, um, I think it's easier to see from the learning. If, when I do this picture, instead of distraction, I do it in learning. And, and I do it as percentage of the time on the smartphone, then I think it's going to be more clear. But then let's discuss that point there. Okay. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's not the total amount of distraction or learning that matters for your performance, is whether this distraction or this took place on the smartphone or off the smartphone. And the results that, I, that I'm going to show you, the way I look at them is whatever happens on the smartphone is more intensive than whatever happens off the smartphone. So if you're distracted on the smartphone, 
you're much more distracted than if it was distraction of the smartphone. And when you're learning on the smartphone, that seems to be much more effective than when we were learning off the smartphone. So whatever happens on the smartphone makes a, makes a difference. So here I have these two conditions, the ones that have smartphones, TA and TI, and time on the smartphone, okay? And here is in condition TA, the fact that uh, students spend on average nine minutes on the smartphone per lecture, and the bulk of that time is on distraction, when the teacher didn't ask the students, let's use the smartphone to learn something. Right? This is the condition where the students use the smartphone at will. They spend nine minutes on the smartphone, of which 8.5 is actually a uh, distraction. So how much did the students use the smartphone to learn in this condition? How much is the students use, left to their own devices use the smartphone to, to learn? Only 1% of the time that they spend learning during the lecture. So this in uh, eight, about 80 minutes learning during the lecture, they only spend half a minute of the time that they spend learning, they only spend 1% of the time in the, in, on the smartphone. Yes, yes, it could be, it, uh, it's essentially using the app but could be some, 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 uh, anything that they would do on the smartphone that could be classified as learning, like looking the word at something else. Or something. But when the smartphone is used for instruction purposes, then the picture is very different, right? So here, when the smartphone is used for instruction, the amount of the time that the students spend on the smartphone is the same, but there's a substitution from distraction to learning. And so the time that the students, the percentage of the time that the students spend learning on the smartphone goes from this very little to this very big, from 1% to 5.3%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's very different. And so, um, so, okay. And so, because they spend the same amount of time distracted on both conditions versus learning, and they spend the same amount of time on the smartphone in both conditions as well, a change in learning from the smartphone, to, uh, from, away to the, from the smartphone to the smartphone, and, and, and uh, let me say that again. So, because the use of smartphone is the same and the, the total distraction is the same, there's a substitution in between learning and distraction from smartphones to, to learning. And so, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the 1% to 5.3% is a seven time increase, I think here you're seeing that this still 1.5 out of 6, right? Which balances the other one. And so I'm, I'm going to try to show that this decrease, uh, this, in, this, decrease in, this increase in distraction reduces your performance, and this increase in learning increases your performance, right? So maybe that's what. Right. Um, well, uh, uh, yes, but I have that in a regression, and I think it's identified. And I think what happens is I'm picking up that effect from from variance in uh, distraction versus students because some have there's bounds on these on these things, right? Some of them might have uh, uh, might have um, separated, might have substituted a lot whereas others didn't substitute so much. So I can show that significant substitution is what drives the result. Um, so that's where I'm trying to get at. 
So there's a seven, seven time increase. And how do I do that in regression terms? Because I cannot get that from here because everything is, is, is endogenous in this case, right? Uh, so the regression that I'm trying to run is to say, here is the performance gain. gain. Here is how much time I spend distracted on the smartphone. And here is how much I spend learning, uh, how much I spend distracted on the smartphone versus total distraction. Okay, so this is the intensity of the distraction activity on the smartphone compared to all distraction. And here is learning. Okay, I'm going to try to run this regression. And the point that I'm trying to make here is, as you increase the percentage of the time you are distracted to your smartphone, your performance goes down. And but if you increase the percentage of the time that you spend learning towards the smartphone side, then it increases your performance. So my expectation is this one negative, this one positive. Is that what I'm trying to, to, to say? Um, and how do I run this regression? I have two endogenous variables because those two things here are endogenous, right? How much time you spend on the smartphone distracted and learning, it's up to you. But I have two instruments because I have three conditions, right? I have condition C, I have condition TI, and I have condition TA. So with three conditions, I have at least two instruments for two endogenous variables. Okay? So I'll just do IV. Right? I have uh, two IVs, uh, which are TA and TI, for these two endogenous variables. Right? And here are the results. Let me start with the far right, which are the first stages which behave as expected. What is the, 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 the control condition here is no smartphones. So when we put smartphones into the classroom, either TA or TI, the time on the smartphone, both distracted and learning increases. That's expected, right? Because what was the time that you spent on the smartphone learning and distracted when there were no smartphones in the classroom? Zero, right? So all of these are positive and statistically significant, meaning that the smartphone, when it got into the classroom in either TI or TA, made a difference in the times. And when we do the second stage regression, we find what we were expecting. That the um, distraction on the smartphone reduces your performance and uh, uh, learning on the smartphone increases your performance. And these are the percentage times on the smartphone versus total distraction and total learning. Right? Okay? So if I, spend, uh, if I spend 50 minutes learning of which 10 are on the smartphone, that coverage is one-fifth, okay? And so what essentially what I'm talking about here is that whether then you get learning or distracted on the smartphone is, is more intense, both for the good and for the bad, compared to what you would have otherwise done if the smartphone was not in the classroom. And the other thing that I've been talking about that I think for me is interesting from this exercise is if you include here how much time am I learning in total doesn't have any effect on the performance, because it's not how much time you spend distracted versus that matters, is whether you did that on the smartphone or not. Okay. Yeah, but the baselines are also very different, right? It's 10 minutes distracted versus 80 minutes learning, and so I would be very anxious in uh, in getting those marginals. Um, I don't want to look to 213, um, and perhaps we need to normalize something there. So, uh, can we actually even know a little bit more what's going on? Um, and find some heterogeneous effects so that we can actually, I hope, provide some ideas, specific ideas for policy analysis as well. Let me show you uh, what happens with students in IT majors versus non-IT majors. Uh, there's no silver bullet. All the results are uh, driven by students in IT majors. So we have the, the that archival data, so we know which student is in, in which major they are. And uh, there are some majors that are classified as IT majors by the school, e-commerce, computerized accounting, animation, game design. Everything else is financing uh, uh, and so on, and account, uh, accounting. Uh, there's computerized accounting and accounting and, and something else. Uh, and what happens is the results that I showed you so far all come from students in IT majors. Students in non-IT majors, similar test scores and all conditions. Nothing um, uh, happens uh, to those guys. The total time learning and distracted is the same for both IT majors and non-IT majors across all conditions. 
Also across all conditions, the time on the smartphone for IT measures and non-IT measures is the same. So what is actually going on here with the students in IT measures versus students in non-IT measures? Well, one thing that could happen is uh, that the students in non-IT measures would just not try to use the smartphone to learn. They're not familiar with apps and so on and so forth. Well, they actually spend more time learning with a smartphone than the students with, uh, with, with IT measures. The students with non-IT measures spend 4.4 minutes learning on a smartphone versus 2.4 minutes for the students with, with the IT measures. But this doesn't help, I just told you that. The IT measures is the ones that are driving the results, not the non-IT measures. So the non-IT measures spend more time trying to learn on the smartphone, but doesn't help. I guess that tells us that uh, the students in IT measures are more productive using the, the, the app that we gave them or, or something else. Um, and I would say that if additional effort is needed to help the non-IT measures, it's gotta be from benefiting from the smartphone. Yeah. Uh, like what? Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, everybody has access, sure, everybody has access to the same kind of apps, right? And uh, Yes, yes. Students in non-IT measures spend less time distracted. So one thing could be that the students in non-IT measure, non measures is not that they don't benefit from the app, it's that they spend more time distracted, no, less time distracted. So from both sides of the, of the conversation, it seems they were trying, right? It's just that they couldn't get there. And, and so it's not that uh, we introduce the smartphone into the classroom, the non-IT measures get more distracted, and so we would need to actually gear our efforts towards reducing the distraction of these guys. No, I think they were actually trying, and they actually spend less time distracted because they spend more time trying to learn on the smartphone. Is I, f I feel there's some pretty good evidence here to say that it's the app, it's helping them to use the app more productively. Okay. Uh, Again, there's no silver bullet. All the results are, are driven by students that were already on the map of the distribution of the grades to begin with, okay? So the punchline is that uh, the smartphone is not helping the lower, uh, the underperforming students. So we have the pretests, remember? The pretests are a measure of how much did you know about this before? How good a student you are if you want and so on and so forth. So let's look at, uh, at the bottom tercile of the distribution and the top tercile of distribution of pretest scores to label students as overperforming or high performance and low performance. And the results are all driven by high performing students. Okay. Again, the total time learning and distracted is the same for high performance and low performance and the total time on the smartphone is the same for um, high performers and low performers in conditions TA and TI, but the low performing students do not benefit much from using the smartphone. So one result that we find is when the smartphones are allowed and used to assist instruction, for the, the, the low performing students, this is as good as banning them from the classroom. Remember we had smartphones allowed, when we banned them from the classroom, things get better, and when we allow them into the classroom, but with instruction, it gets even better, not for the low performing students. This delta on using the smartphones to aid instruction doesn't show up for the low performing students. Okay. So they spend much more time distracted away from the smartphone uh, the, the, the low performing students compared to the high performing students. And so uh, what we find in the data is that allowing the smartphones into the classroom without instruction reduces other distraction in favor of smartphone based distraction. Okay? We put the smartphones into the classroom, they used to be distracted some, with something else, now they are distracted with the smartphone. But then when you ask them to use the smartphone for instruction, the, the, the Distraction reduces, but only for the high performing students. This reduction in the distraction for the, for on, on the smartphone for the 
uh, for the low-performing students, we don't find that, only for the high-performing students. So if there's additional effort needed to, low, to help low-performing students take advantage of the smartphone, that might be to reduce distraction both on and, on, on and off the smartphones for these kinds, these kinds of students. So I have a feeling here, and I wanted to know more, but I have a feeling here that when the smartphone gets into the classroom, the low-performing students get distracted even away from the smartphone. It might be something that they're not familiar with or they don't see an immediate way of using it and they get even distracted with other things. It's really on aggregate the distraction, the introduction of the smartphone for these guys. So I think the, the results are interesting in the sense that we have an example here of, we're not gonna ban the smartphones from the classroom. Everybody's gonna have one in their pocket or in the, wearables or whatever it is. I think it's going to be extremely hard to get technology off the classroom. People use technology and they'll carry technology into the classroom. What we need is to find ways to allow the technology into the classroom and make something better. And this is an example in which uh, we show that banning, yes, gets you somewhere, but allowing and using it actively for learning purposes uh, makes you have feel makes you get even better results and I was happy with that I was somewhat sad to find the heterogeneous effects that I show you yeah this is all great but this is all driven by students in IT majors and students that were already good to begin with so students that were already good to begin with is kind of um, sad but students in IT majors I think we, we have some idea here of why this might be happening Right? And so hopefully these are, these looking at these times and how they apportion time to learning on the smartphone versus distracting and so on can give us some ideas about how to tackle. And clearly we need to tackle students in IT measures, different from students in non-IT measures and low and high performing students differently. Okay. Um, that's pretty much what I had to say. Um, and I think that instead of going through the summary of findings, which I, which I just did. Perhaps we could have some questions, because uh, if you remember what I talked about, I mean, there's no point in spending five minutes to, to summarize. I just wanted to acknowledge some limitations, OK? Um, results may depend on the subject. This is Chinese verbal, right? And on the app used. Again, this app was de developed by us with minimal effort for the purpose of this experiment. So, of course, you can screw up, but if you're a professional in developing apps for education, you can probably do better than what we did in a couple of hours. Right? So, the, think of this as a lower bound, perhaps, on, on how good the technology can be in, in, in school. And I would argue that maybe the results apply without too much change to tablet, because they allow for similar things. Distraction versus learning, same kinds of apps, internet access. It's a bigger screen, okay, you can say bigger screen versus small screen is gonna have an effect. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat confident that uh, we find here some micro mechanisms that, that could, um, could uh, generalize to other settings. Okay? So, thank you for your time today. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions? We have about 10 minutes left. More questions? Sure. Um, so I've got some questions about, uh, I love the way you presented it today because it's very suspenseful and I'm waiting for the results. Uh, you said this paper is under review, right? Uh, is. On, at ISR or where is it? Uh, management science. Management science, okay. Um, what, were you, what were your hypotheses? What were you expecting when you set this management up? Management science? Oh, oh no no! <laughs> <laughs> I know what to expect from management science, but uh, what uh, how, how, when you wrote this paper? What yep. were your upfront like hypotheses, your expectations? Mm -hmm. um, so there was one thing that I I wanted to put on the table that I don't know if I was a hundred percent successful, but this is way better than what I did before, which was I wanted to know more about how the distraction versus learning trade-offs work for IT majors, non-IT majors, low performing, high performing. And, this I, and, and I, I came into this work thinking that what's gonna happen is this is gonna affect the amount of time distracted and learning, and that's where we're gonna get the results from. And in some sense, this is not new, because most significant literature in education is about you get technology, people get distracted, people get learning, and there's always this trade-off. I thought we started having a paper when I looked at the amount of time distracted and learning, and it's the same across all conditions. 
That's what I think is interesting here. Um, that that is not a predictor. So, so, so if I want to make it, I'll tell you how much time students spend distracted and learning in the not enough to know what's going to happen to them. It's whether they do it on the technology or not. I think that's a very powerful message. Uh, because all the prior, prior literature is about distraction versus learning and that's it. And when I find that on aggregate this is all the same, I think that's when it started being, uh, uh, being an interesting paper. Because my going into it, as my hypothesis was that, oh, we're gonna, smartphones go into the classroom, everybody's gonna get distracted, this is gonna be one more paper about that. I think we have more than that in that story. That's, that was my prior. <laughs> And um, I'm going to ask you a question that I get asked, and I never have a good answer for it. So, I'm, uh, which is, um, you you were wondering about what's a good predictor, um, but what you're showing us is really what is a good explanator, <laughs> or something like that. Um, and why use regression? Why not regression trees, or you know, why why not a, a more predictive tool? Um, that may capture nonlinearities and other things, if you're talking about yeah. prediction is uh, um, important yeah. thing. I, I, I was even reluctant in using regressions. I just used t-tests and that's enough, right? I think that my goal here is to show a causal effect and the t-tests are enough for that. Even the t-tests with only these students are enough to show me the heterogeneous effects. I don't need to run. In the paper, I don't actually think I have interactions with the type of students. I just look at the times and I actually see what's, what's going on. Um, so the goal here is not an exercise in prediction. I'm using the word prediction because it resonates with, with uh, when I say that discovery doesn't predict. I think we all understand what I'm talking about, but I think it's much more than that. So maybe I shouldn't use the word prediction because my role here, goal here is not to predict anything, is to show the causal effect of, in, of these policies on performance through these changes in behavior, okay? Um, and I think there's, again, is there significant discussion between distraction versus learning? And where I was coming from, my co-authors were coming from, and most people are coming from, is that technology comes into the classroom and everybody's gonna get much more distracted. No, the technology comes into the classroom. In a controlled environment, people don't actually get more distracted, but if they get more distracted on that technology that seems to be more intensive, then performance goes down, okay? So, maybe I'm using too much of the word prediction. It's just to say that, that that's not what matters. What matters is how their portion, how their portion on and off the smartphone, distraction versus learning, okay? Um, so I was wondering just uh, why why China, uh, why was the reaction you know done in China? And what I'm thinking is that uh, in China teachers are very very highly respected, right? And uh, mm -hmm. this global teacher status, you know, that the Chinese eighty percent of the time yes, learning exactly. In class. So I, I figured yeah. that probably over there uh, smartphones are much less of a distraction than in other countries, like maybe here in the U.S. or, you know, I'm coming from Brazil, where Brazil is on the opposite side of the scale. I'm guessing, I'm wondering that over there, probably cell phones would be, or smartphones would be much more harmful, have much bigger distraction, because right. teachers are not as respected as in China. Right. Um, why China? Because we had the opportunity. Um, I have, as I told you in the beginning, yeah, as I, no, but as I told you in the beginning of, of the talk, I have been for a long time trying to bring our cities to bear in education. It is always very hard to say, now I'm going to run my students into uh, classes. Um, I can randomize the movies that you recommend and then all these kinds of things in all this paper. I can even randomize number of likes and a bunch of different things. But randomizing students into classes is very difficult. We had an opportunity to work with this school to do that. Now, this is in a setting that is particular. But my uh, expectation is that once we have this work, we can try and now replicate in other cases because these guys in this school were very enthusiastic with this work because essentially what you're saying is, look, the technology can be put into the classroom, improve performance, here is a way to do it. Now let's try with different apps if we want and so on and so forth. So I think the results are encouraging and this is like a, an entry point to now replicate this in other places. I don't know if it's gonna be easy to replicate in other places, but for the external validity, I would like to do it in different countries with different baselines and different contexts and so on and so forth. Other thing, the, the other opportunity here was 
we can have these times because we have the, the, the video uh, from, from the lectures. And I think that's, that provides for a very unique data set at the student level that I don't know if I can replicate. I know I can replicate in other cases by asking the students to estimate the time, but that's always you know, self-reported. I don't know what's going to happen. So a mix of opportunity, ability to do RCT, ability to get these new data sets, and hopefully people will pick it up and want to do it in other places. Yeah. All right. Thank you.